so right? fun either. And <laughs> that's a third problem, yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, but anyway, yeah. If somebody has a talent they want to share, uh, let us know. Uh, we won't consider you bragging about it at all. So uh, it's not bragging if you can do it, as they say. <laughs> I can whistle. <laughs> you can. Well, good for you. Okay, we'll go ahead and start the class in. We're beginning rule four. It took us a while to get through rule, rule three and rule four. Uh, might take a while also. There's quite a bit of meat in this. Okay, here is rule four. Sound, light, vibration, and form blend and merge, and thus the work is one. It proceedeth under the law, and naught can hinder now the work from going forward. The man breathes deeply, he concentrates his forces, and drives the thought form from him. Okay, is that really clear for everybody? Everybody understand that? <laughs> okay, yeah. Uh, I think... It did for me. I, for, for for the first time in in all of DK's books, I felt like he was talking to me on that chapter. <laughs> oh, really? Good. Yeah. Well, think about it. He's talking about movement in different directions. He's talking geometry, and he's finally talking my subject here. <laughs> yeah. Well, good. Good. Yeah. There's a lot of even so. There's a lot of meat in this, but um, he points out that. What he's trying to do is, he says this material, to really appreciate it, one has to move to the plane of the mind. And on the plane of the mind, uh, one can see from a higher angle of vision. And he makes this statement, love attracts, but mind attracts, repels, and coordinates, so its potency is inconceivable. So that's interesting. Mind attracts and repels, whereas love just attracts. So he says, my, now here he's talking about the higher mind, the higher aspect of mind. So the higher aspect of mind actually embraces the attractive quality of love, but it also has a possibility of repelling, um, coordinating, putting things together, so everything works. And the mind, the higher mind has an appreciation of love and uses love. So love is never neglected. But a lot of teachers out there tell us the way to, the way to enlightenment is to leave the mind behind. Now, is there any truth to that or is it completely wrong? They're speaking of the lower mind. Right, they're right. They're mainly thinking of the lower mind, and in meditation, for instance, one of the teachings common in most meditation methods is to still your thinking. But to still your thinking of the lower mind isn't really leaving it behind. It's nearly causing it to not interfere with going the next step up. When you say that's true, Edward. Yes, it's part of our equipment. Too. In the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, I've been reading lately, he talks about the lower mind, they call it the cheetah, you know, and I, I've, I thought, well, look, I need to cage the cheetah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a, I, I never thought of comparing it to the animal, but uh, cheetah is the fastest animal on earth, if I remember right. And so, yeah, our thoughts are racing along a lot. And if we're thinking of what we're going to eat or uh, what we're going to do tomorrow or a movie you're going to watch, <clears throat> then your meditation really won't be very effective. So you do have to learn to still, especially still the lower mind. But, and a lot of people interpret that to be mindless. Now, it's interesting that even when you hear a teaching that you know is literally wrong, there is still maybe some truth in that teaching. And the truth about mindlessness is that you need to quiet the mind as if 
the regular lower thinking mind doesn't exist, but you need, not all the time, but in s certain type times where you need trying to access the soul, it has to be done in silence. Now silence doesn't mean that the one who is silent doesn't exist. The existence is still there. The existence of the mind is still there. But uh, people, a, a lot of teachers interpret the fact of stilling the mind to mindlessness, and that's a step too far in the interpretation. We don't want to go that far because especially the higher mind is extremely important. Um, <clears throat> because the higher mind gives access to all the other minds in the universe clear up to the solar logos. Clear up to the solar logos can be accessed by the higher mind, and then the higher mind can also access all the elements of the personality, from the lower mind to the astral body to the physical brain. So the higher mind is a midway point which is centered on the soul, the soul consciousness. And so it accesses the soul, clear up to the monad, clear up to the solar logos, and clear down to matter itself and the physical brain. So this, the higher mind is extremely important to develop. But what's the difference between the higher mind and the lower mind anyway? The lower mind is an instrument of perception. You tune it right. like a radio. Okay, that's good. And what's a higher mind? The higher mind is the quality of the triad, the eternal being. Okay. And where does the higher mind bring its information from? The rain cloud of knowable things. Right. Now, the lower mind deals with facts. And like 2 plus 2 equals 4, sky is blue, temperature is 74 degrees. The higher mind deals more with principles and bring things, brings things down from the level of the intuition. So it brings things, principles and ideas down from uh, the higher level down to the lower. And it's also in contact with the wisdom aspect of the heart center. So, uh, so it, it's, it's in communication with all things. And the Tibetan itself, himself says in his famous introduction, he says, the mind is a plane on which what will be found? The, the, the elder brother. The masters. The right, master. right. The mind is a plane on which the masters will be found. Okay, that's the importance of the, it's also the plane on which the soul can be found, and the soul is a master on its own plane. So that's uh, the development of the higher mind and the understanding of it is extreme importance. We're getting some feedback here. Is that, uh, is your mic on again, Stacy? So if it is, you might want to mute I'm that. Only, I, I apologize. Oh, okay. Well, Darren, good to see you. Let's see, Darren's just joined us here. Okay. He points out that the higher mind is into group thought. And to imagine what the world would be like if the mind were to dominate instead of the emotions. Now here we're talking about the higher mind in connection with the lower. The lower mind is capable of a certain amount of reasoning of which the pure raw emotional person isn't capable. So, so it shouldn't be discounted entirely. But the higher and lower mind together, once they dominate, he says, imagine how the world would be different. Right now, what, what dominates the world right now? It is a mind, but it's something else. What is it? The race mind, the emotional mind. Feelings. Right, right. the emotional mind, their feelings. Have any of you ever taken a sales course before? 
Yeah, I've been a salesman a good portion of my life. I've taken a number of sales courses and they always stress one thing. They say, if you want to sell this product, he says, you don't use your mind. You don't use reasoning with them. He says, you appeal to their emotions. If you can appeal to their emotions and make, their, make them emotionally want this product, he says, then you got to sell. And I've never been an extremely emotional person. So uh, for some types of products that require a lot of emotions, I uh, wasn't that good at. <laughs> like, I wasn't a very good vacuum cleaner salesman. And I wasn't a very good health spa salesman. But I was good in real estate and signs and other things where I could uh, concentrate on using my mind uh, for sales. But for for to talk somebody into buying a $500 vacuum cleaner when they could get one for $100 at the store that could do basically the same thing, he had to really appeal to their emotions. <laughs> I had that exact same experience trying to sell Kirby vacuum cleaners and I never sold one. Yeah, right. It's a, uh, I, I sold uh, the compact, which was uh, at that time a uh, competitor to the Kirby and similar in price range. And uh, yeah, the, it takes, uh, it takes a lot of razzle dazzle to sell those vacuum cleaners. And I wasn't very successful. I think I sold one to my uh, cousin and then he canceled. <laughs> <laughs> was a real bummer. But, um, I owned one uh, when we lived in Vegas for about five years. I owned a Kirby, and I fell in love with that thing. I cleaned the whole house to top to bottom of that Kirby. Uh, yeah, I wish I had one today. As a matter of fact, a lot uh, of people swear I by some. Yeah, some of those uh, vacuum cleaners aren't that aren't that bad. Have a lot of uh, uh, extra. So imagine what the world would be like, he says, if, you know, in other words, if, if we could sell people by their mind rather than their emotions, if you could say, well, you know, this product will do ABC and, and the logical explanation sells them more than like, uh, boy, just imagine how you'd feel in that Corvette riding down the street and all the good looking girls looking at you. I mean, that's using like emotion, but it's powerful because people will often buy something like a car just because of the way it's going to make them feel rather than practical transportation, right? So anyway, uh, he says, uh, just imagine, now rem rem the big difference between the Piscean age, which we're going out of, and the Aquarian age, which we're going in, is the Piscean age is the most emotional of the signs. It has the most emotional energy within it. And the Aquarian age is, is one of the most mental. And it's also ruled by Ray 7, whereas the Piscean age is ruled by Ray 6, which is uh, the Ray 6 controls the solar plexus. So as we look back on the past 2,000 years and see all the uh, emotional things people did, they burned heretics at the stake, they had the, uh, all kinds of crusades and wars and fighting for Christ and everything. And it was all very, it was all of a, a very emotional age. And now we're moving into the Aquarian and leaving that powerful emotion behind is difficult, even though we have switched over, basically moved over in the Aquarian age, it's going to take at least another 100, maybe 200 years before we can escape uh, that emotional energy, which is controlling, still controlling most of the world today. I mean, it's, it's a powerful energy to leave behind. Just like the salesman has a very difficult time moving the prospect away from accepting emotionally to accepting mentally the uh, product. And so it's, uh, uh, it would be interesting to contemplate what the difference will be. Now, another thing DK tells us is there are a lot of six ray souls on the earth right now, and they're not going to be replaced, a lot of them. So as the six ray souls go out of incarnation, we're going to have more like 
seventh ray souls and and uh, third ray souls and fifth ray souls come in, second ray souls that uh, will take us more toward the mind. And this will be one of the main things that will make the difference. And he said this some time ago, so we're probably living in a time now where a lot of kids coming into existence now are um, have have uh, are on rays that will be more conducive to understanding mind and when you look at these uh, films on uh, some of the uh, uh, talk show hosts so that they give where they interview the man on the street or the kid in college and ask him uh, who fought in the Civil War or Revolutionary War or who the vice president is and they don't know anything about that, but they know everything about rock stars. Uh, it kind of makes you wonder, but uh, you know, there's a lot of smart kids out there too. So, um, and hopefully the rising generation will contain a lot of these people that the Tibetan predicted would appear that would help to move us onto the plane of the mind. So the world will be a lot better place when we get there. Let's hope few of them uh, surface in North Korea, China, and Russia, to these problem areas of the earth to uh, kind of guide them in the right direction also. And we need a lot of guidance here. We're right now, look at the political division we have right now. It's uh, so many politicians are just centered completely in the feeling energy. And the other side is wrong no matter what they say, no matter how logical it is. Uh, they just, they're only interested in defending their point of view, whether it be right or wrong. Okay, so he says, um, the uh, first point he wants to make here is the importance of stressing the importance of developing the this higher mind. And the second point of the worker in white magic must be one as much as much as possible one with the soul so he's in tune with the soul so he understands what the soul where the soul is leading him toward the person in other words must have some type of soul, soul contact and the interesting part about soul contact is um, um a lot of all of us, I'd say all of us in the group have had at least a degree of soul contact. I've had some people who I consider to be pretty advanced, expressed doubt as to whether they've ever had contact before. Now, there are many who've had some contact because it's so subtle, they don't realize that they have had guidance and contract be, contact before. For instance, maybe you've reached a a crossroads in your life and you have to make a decision and you feel that a certain decision is the way to go. So you pick a certain path and you may not realize it, but your soul has been sending you an impression to take this path and you took the right path because you actually picked up something from your soul on that. So many people pick up things from their soul, even though they're not completely aware of it. But once a person has achieved full soul contact, he will be aware and he will know definitely he has uh, uh, had contact. But in the, in the process from beginning to full contact, the person will have a lot of doubts in between. I like to compare it to the movie uh, Ghost. Remember Patrick Swayze after he died was trying to get the attention of Demi Moore and he would do all kinds of things and every once in a while he, he would maybe make an object move or do something that maybe caught her attention and made her wonder, now is, is he really trying to talk to me or send me a message? And this is a little bit about the way it is with a soul. Soul has to kind of wave its hands, jump up and down, shout at us. <laughs> and we're a little bit like Demi Moore and we think, uh, now am I receiving something or not? And this is the way it is a little bit at first for the disciple. 
But what he has to do is pay attention to it. And if he pays attention to it and follows it, then the next time the recognition will be easier. And when he follows it, the next recognition will be easier until pretty soon he will know for sure when he is receiving a uh, communication from the soul. Okay, any questions so far? Okay, the person must have, uh, the, the worker in white magic must have, or the disciple we could say, the one that's following the path of return, um, must center himself on the soul for these following reasons, he says. He says, only the soul has a direct and clear understanding of the creative purpose and the plan. So your soul has a vision of the plan, not only the plan of the hierarchy, but the plan for your life. Before you were born, you were one with your soul and your soul planned out your life as it is now. And you will probably be surprised when we return as to how much of our life followed the plan that we originally formulated. Um, sometimes we go off, it just doesn't, nothing, always works out according to plan. But uh, uh, we, I think uh, we will be surprised how much our lives followed what we, uh, what we actually planned on. Next he says, only the soul whose nature is intelligent love can be trusted with knowledge. The symbols and the formulas which are necessary to correct conditioning of the magical work. Okay, symbols, formulas, which are necessary. Uh, only the soul can be trusted with them. In other words, you as a lower personality, if you're not connected with your soul, you can't be trusted with uh, all the intelligence necessary to become a white magician. You can only be trusted when the, the, you have soul contact. When you have soul contact, and if you're following the, the impulses from the soul, then you can be trusted. If you're not following them, then you can't be trusted. So the more you follow the advice and the imp uh, imp impulses and impressions you get from the soul, the more you will be trusted with. Third, he says, only the soul has power to work in the three worlds at once, yet remain detached, and therefore comatically free from the results of such work. Yeah, it's interesting that the soul has no karma affected with you, even though you're an extension of the soul. Uh, the soul itself doesn't have any karma in connection with you. Uh, but we, we here in the physical realm create the karma, but the soul doesn't suffer any karma from impressions it gives to you because it gives, it's completely detached from, uh, uh, us as far as how we carry them out. He it sends us our impression, then it's up to us to carry it out. And in carrying them out incorrectly, we can create karma. But the soul itself doesn't create it. Four, he says, only the soul is truly group conscious and is actuated by a pure, unselfish purpose. Okay. Five, only the soul with an open eye of vision can see the end from the beginning and can hold in steadiness the true picture of the ultimate consummation. Okay, the end from the beginning. <clears throat> Some scriptures say that God sees the end from the beginning. The soul is, of course, connected to the one great life, which we call God. So the soul sees the end from the beginning. Before we were born, we saw the potential end of our life, what we wanted it to be, and the beginning of our life. We, the soul saw the end from the beginning. And in sending us impressions as we move along, those impressions are to help us to reach that end that we actually planned on when we were one, one with the soul before we were born. So it's interesting to think about. 
Also interesting to think about is when you think of you and your soul, think of you and your dream state. In your dream state, you are not your full self. When you dream, what happens is the mental part of yourself goes back to the soul. And what is left is the life thread, which is connected to your emotional self. And so when you enter a dream, you enter a dream that is conjured up by your emotional nature minus your mind. That's why dreams don't make any sense. Like I dreamt the other day that I met President Obama and he wanted me to go get him some French fries. And I thought, well, what in the world was that about? <laughs> you know, yeah. A lot of people think the symbolism in dreams has really heavy meaning, and never once in a while you are sent a message through symbolism in dreams. But a lot of the things that happen in dreams are uh, don't make any sense whatsoever, and that's because they're uh, uh, created by you, which isn't all there. Only your emotional self is there, which creates it. But as entities, any life forms, craves experience. And because we crave experience, we even have experience when we're asleep. And when we're asleep, we dream, and not all of us is there in the dream. Now, you can do some crazy stuff in your dream. You can, like, shoot somebody, and your waking person doesn't have any uh, karma from that shooting the guy in the dream. I mean, you, because you're detached from it. <laughs> now, this, let's compare this analogy to you and the soul. When you incarnate on the earth, your soul is not all there. Just like when you dream, you're not all there either. But when you wake up from your dream, more of you is there. When we die and then we wake up from this mortal life, more of us will be there in the soul life than, than are here in the physical life. But when we're project, the soul projects down, all of the soul's abilities are not there. It's, it's limited a lot more than the life is in the soul world. And, be, and through this limitation, we, uh, uh, the soul doesn't have any karma in connection with us. Just like you can go shoot somebody in a dream or make love to somebody that's not your wife and then wake up and you don't have any repercussions from it. The same thing with the soul. The soul itself is beyond the karma that you connect here in this earth life. And all the karma is accumulated that has to be worked out in the physical realm. And so the goal of, this, of the disciple is to um, connect with the soul so he can bring down the full qualities of the soul down here to the earth so that he can make that connection. A little bit like in your, uh, the dream state where you want to become a a vivid dreamer, or whatever it's called, and be conscious of the dream. We want to be conscious. We want the soul to be conscious of the dream state and have a, a connecting link there. Okay. Any by other com comments before we move on? Yeah, by the way, uh, French fries aren't in my dream dictionary. <laughs> 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 yeah, I never. <laughs> I said uh, I should have looked that up. Is Obama in there? <laughs> yeah, I don't know why he wanted those French fries. He thought I could deliver some really good French fries for him for some reason. Okay. Now he asks a question: Do workers in the black magic have? equal power to those in the light. Okay, let me put this out to the group. What do you guys think? Do the black magicians, uh, uh, can they connect to the soul or do they have 
similar powers? Can they, they're called magicians. We I have think, white magicians and black magicians. So what's the difference? I think they, the black ones do can work on the mental plane, but it's only in the downward direction. They can't yeah. work upward from there. Yeah. Right. Maria just give a good answer there. We'll get to that in just a minute. Yeah. They, um, any other, uh, what are other differences? Nick, let's pick on you. What do you think that the difference is? Uh, well, the, the black magicians work, you know, with the material world and in relation to self. Um, and it may be that in some cases they appear to have more power in, in sort of a short term context, but I don't think they have as much power as white magicians do. Well, very good answer. Good answer. And Maria added that uh, they don't have a connection to their souls either, which makes a big difference. Because they don't have a connection to their souls, all the things that Nick said is true is that they concentrate on the material side. And as Rick said, they also are able to access the power of the three worlds, mind, emotion, and the material with ex excessive concentration on the material side. Um, so could it also be, could it also be that um, they were thinking in a very low vibrational frequency. And it's easier for us to think along those lines because that's what we're accustomed to living in the material world. So uh, they can only move uh, into the higher spiritual realm by thinking and producing this uh, frequency of a higher energy. Uh, uh, whenever you start concentrating uh, for uh, uh, the learning of powers, whether the light or the dark, it's easier to get into the dark because that lower energy flows downhill, you know. Right, that's a good uh, point, Stacy. Uh, is uh, the lower energy that's flowing downhill. And as Nick pointed out, the dark brothers are able to have faster results, and more immediate results. Thus, they appear to have more power, but he's, the Tibetan says that the results are not long lasting. Oh, well, why don't you mute your button there, uh, Stacy? But, um, pardon? Why don't you mute your uh, button there? You're getting, you're getting a little static again. But anyway, uh, yeah, it's a good point, Stacy, is that, uh, it's like they're taking advantage in the material world. They're like flowing with this, the flow of the stream or going downhill. It's easier for them. Whereas the brothers of light have to kind of go uphill because accessing the spiritual world is much more difficult than accessing the material world. And so they're, uh, uh, they can achieve what appears to be a lot faster results than the Brotherhood of Light. Whereas the Brotherhood of Light, their results once achieved are much more uh, enduring. Whereas the uh, Brotherhood of Darkness is uh, very much ephemeral. We can kind of see this in the, uh, uh, what happened during World War II. The Dark Brothers were behind Hitler and the Nazis and they achieved amazingly quick results. They just startled the world so much that they appeared to be uh, uh, an unstoppable force. And it appeared that uh, at first that uh, there was no way to stop Hitler once he began World War II and conquered most of Europe. But then when the uh, uh, allies got their act together and uh, started focusing. Uh, they eventually did produce uh, uh, results that defeated the uh, Axis powers. And the results of that defeat have been, uh, uh, will be quite long lasting, 
hopefully we don't uh, retrogress, but uh, if we take advantage of that, the uh, we can have positive results from that uh, um, uh, defeat of the dark forces for a long, from here on out, hopefully. Okay. I think another limitation uh, on the Dark Brothers is if they're dark enough, they're not even going to be able to set foot on the physical. They'll just instantly go up in flames or something. Their karma is just so bad that they have to rely on uh, henchmen that aren't quite as evil as them to work down on the physical plane for them. Right. There are certain Dark Brothers that are beyond... The, don't even have the capacity to incarnate and they have to work through uh, physical agents. And they're kind of like the anti-soul to the Dark Brothers here. The Dark Brothers don't contact the soul, but they can contact some lower, even lower vibrations than themselves, which is, uh, I wouldn't want to have any part of, of that myself. It's about the worst thing we could think of. Now, he's, speaking of the Dark Brothers, he says this. They carry destruction and disaster in their wake, and the Black Magician is eventually submerged in the resulting, resulting cataclysm. What's the really famous cataclysm that they, called, that they caused? Atlantis. <laughs> right. They cause the sinking of Atlantis because they misuse their powers. A lot of uh, the, the hierarchy uh, worked a lot more openly with men, and men, men took that uh, knowledge and they used it incorrectly, and it wind up destroying the whole uh, continent, and we had to start over again. Yeah, they, uh, you can't really call that a win for them, it's merely a setback for the workers of light, and it was a ended with a defeat for them. They thought they had won, but then at the point where they thought they had won, <laughs> the continent sank. So they didn't really win after all. Now, where's uh, uh, modern day um, examples of just wrong-headed dark moves that have produced? cataclysms. Well, Saddam Hussein and all his evil brothers. Yeah, that was a good one. Uh, uh, he'd, he didn't really completely destroy himself. We had the uh, United States had to go there and uh, take care of him. Sometimes these nations uh, will destroy themselves. Like, how about the Soviet Union? It's collapsed. It kind of collapsed through its own um, mistakes, didn't it? Well, the same thing for Romania and several other of those countries. Right, right. And uh, right now we're watching it in Venezuela. Venezuela's been taken over by uh, tyrannical uh, uh, powers and trying to control the people, absolutely. And, and it's starting to collapse on its own weight. Uh, North Korea is the same way right now. Did you read about this guy that just escaped North Korea a while back? He said his family actually had to eat dirt to survive. I mean, I didn't know you could eat dirt without killing yourself, but I read about people in North Korea eating tree bark and grass, uh, but they're having a heck of a time. They're about like three, four inches shorter, the average North Korean than the South Korean person. And then if, have you probably seen the satellite pictures of North and South Korea. North and South South Korea is full of light, and North Korea just a little dot or two of light in the whole continent, but or the whole country. So um, it's uh, collapsing in on itself. I think that's why Kim Jong Un wants to have a meeting with Trump because uh, last I heard that. Uh, a lot of his nuclear testing facilities have collapsed on themselves. And I think his idea is to uh, tell Trump he's going to destroy his uh, nuclear facilities, but they've already been destroyed. So uh, uh, he's just um, using that as an excuse to try to get more money from the West is, is quite possible. But... Um, there's yeah. 
comments there uh, from Maria and Troy. I don't know if you want to look at those. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, what did they say? I don't see it there now. Well, um, Maria asks, are sociopaths dark agents or used by them? And then Troy listed Hitler, Stalin, Lenin, Paul, and All I, these bad guys, huh? Yeah, they're, they're, um, uh, a lot of these bad guys used by the Dark Brothers uh, will collapse in on themselves. Hitler was a lot more close agent to the Dark Brothers than Stalin. Stalin was just a, a thug, pretty much. Uh, the reason Hitler was more dangerous than Stalin, even though Stalin actually killed more people, uh, is because Hitler was very intelligent. And Hitler was able to get people followers to follow him with their own free will. I mean, the people that surrounded Hitler actually loved the guy and they supported him. And that's what made him so powerful is he captivated the minds of close followers. Whereas Stalin and Mao and people like that, uh, they killed people close to him because they were scared of him. And so the people that were close to like Stalin and Mao, uh, hated him, but they only followed him because of fear, fear of their lives. Whereas Hitler had the power to uh, captivate the minds of the people that were with him. And he captivated most of the people in the Nazi party thought he was like the second coming. And so that's what made Hitler a lot more dangerous than the typical tyrannical dictator. But uh, Maria was asking about sociopaths. Oh. Yeah, sociopaths, a lot of, well, let's take Hitler, for instance. I wouldn't call Hitler a sociopath. He had his own ideas of right and wrong, and he followed it. But he was more captivated by the illusion. For instance, he felt it was the right thing to do to kill the Jews because it was the right thing to do because they were interfering with what he saw as the good for the planet. So he felt he made a mental decision that it was just something that you had to do to get rid of him. And so um, if he really felt it was wrong, Hitler, uh, Hitler probably felt some bad about doing things that he personally thought was wrong. Now with a sociopath, they don't have much uh, sense of uh, right and wrong one way or another. And uh, People with illnesses like that are, are um, not always usable by either the right or the left, light or dark brothers. Uh, so uh, that's a point to keep in mind is that both sides are looking for people that are talented and usable. And we'll find that the agents of light and dark, say in our government, uh, are people that are quite uh, have uh, quite intelligent and seem to have it all together to their followers. They're not people that are uh, seem to be lacking intelligence or um, wholeness, uh, so to speak. They seem to be. They seem to be capable of performing their duty. On the wall over. Yeah. Well, the thing is, if you want a good example of how the Dark Brothers look, look at how Hitler uh, worked with his people. He got them to follow him with their own free will. And his closest followers supported him 100%. And that's what the Dark Brothers want from their followers, as well as the Brothers of Light. They want complete. Uh, uh, cooperation with uh, uh, based on what they believe to be the right thing. So the Dark Brothers trick their people by illusion into thinking they're doing the right thing when it's not the right thing. And, yeah, but uh, their, their, their time is limited because <laughs> it's, 
If you got billions of starving people, it's only a matter of time before they figure out you can eat the bad guys. Yeah. Yeah, right. JD, what about the Rothschild family? I couldn't hear you. What'd you say? What about the Rothschild family? Uh, speak up a little bit. I still couldn't hear you. What about the Rothschild family? Rothschilds. Oh, the Rothschilds? Well, we don't want to get into that. There's a lot of conspiracy theories, and there's a lot of people that uh, want to control the world. But as I've said in other writings, the real conspiracy is not a physical thing. Uh, the real conspiracy is controlled by invisible forces, and they will work through whoever uh, is most advantageous at the time. Yes, during World was... War II, they worked through uh, Hitler and Germany, and during uh, after World War II, they began to work through the Soviet Union. Now I believe they're working largely through... Uh, 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 terrorists of uh, many of them Islamic, but not all the Islamic people, of course. And so they work through different points of uh, uh, opportunity at different times. And what happens is the conspiracy people find the conspiracy af often after the Dark Brothers have left it. <laughs> so I was, I was asking they move you, around. I, I was beginning to ask if you think they are dark brothers also. Please. You mean some of the conspiracy, some of the people heading the conspiracy are dark brothers? Well, no, the, no, the Rothschilds. The Rothschilds? Yes. Um, it's possible, but uh, yeah, I read a lot of conspiracy books on that type of thing, and uh, uh, but. Yeah, that's that's too vast of a subject to even get into. But uh, if it's uh, something to think about, but the bankers of the world, speaking of the bankers, the DK said that uh, they will be the last ones to accept the uh, qualities of the new age when it comes in. So the bankers will be dragging their feet uh, more than any other group will be. Well, anyone who is run by selfishness and greed will have a difficult time accepting the truth. Yeah, that's true. Now, DK says, four words stand forth as one in rule four. The first is sound, of course, the formula or the word of power which the soul communicates, and so starts the work. The word is dual. It is sounded forth on the note to which the soul responds, his own particular note blended with that of his personality. This chord of two notes is a producer of the resulting effects and is more important than the set phrase composing the word of power. Okay, so he says it's, there's a, a chord of two notes, and the two notes are basically your personality note and your soul note. And he talks about the importance of, uh, uh, he says you have a, also will have a phrase which will be a word of power. And uh, make this understandable, maybe you think back to the movie, uh, The Field of Dreams. In the Field of Dreams, Kevin Costner is out in his cornfield and, and uh, he sees a vision of a baseball field, and then he hears the phrase, if you build it, uh, he will come. And so that's like the word, the word of power, so to speak, that he got. And the, uh, uh, the chord was the notes of the soul and the personality. So uh, the vision is, that he saw was kind of like uh, uh, something from the soul where he saw the baseball field and his personality was thinking, 
well, that'd be great if we, I could build a baseball field here, but it'd be impossible. And then he hears the word of power. If you build it, he will come. So this, uh, this is kind of a symbolism. And this is one of the reasons that so many people keep thinking back to that movie because it's, it's, was, it actually presented uh, uh, kind of a parable of, of a truth which is that um, the disciple at a certain point will receive some type of impression, and that impression translates into a word of power, and then uh, he gets a connection to the soul which impresses him forward. Uh, is anyone, uh, can anyone think of a time in their life when they haven't had the Kevin Costner experience, but it wasn't exactly like that, I'm sure, but uh, can you think of any time in your life when you've had an impression like, if you do it, this will happen? I bet somebody has. I'm going to pick on somebody if I don't hear from anybody. I got that with the motor home. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Rick, I if 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 you, if if I build it and, and go drive it, I'm gonna find a million uh, uses. The soul can use me in a million different ways when I'm on the road with that thing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well that's an interesting one. So yeah. that's a little little bit like that. JJ, I've had one. Okay. Uh, I was on my way to a Christmas party, and I heard an internal male voice say, "Go home." And I, I, I challenged it. I'm like, what, what, why? I heard it again, go home. And I said, well, I, I want to go to the party. And I heard it again, go home. And I argued for at least a mile. And it just kept repeating, go home, go home. So I eventually turned the car around, let the babysitter go home. And I stayed home with my kids and didn't go to the party. And there was absolutely nothing that happened. Nothing. So it occurred to me that something could have or would have happened, but it was not my voice. It certainly wasn't my emotions. It was an internal, heard internally male voice that said, go home. And there was no apology for it. There was no, 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 catastrophic, no catastrophic event that happened. Just go home. And I obeyed it, but I never knew why. Well, maybe... Uh Maybe you would have met some uh, guy who would have been completely a wrong person for you to hook up with or something like that. Maybe it wasn't an accident. Well, was. maybe. I was married at the time, so that would have been a catastrophe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of things. That remind me one time I had a similar experience. I was on my mission, and we're, a whole group of us missionaries was driving in a van. And all of a sudden, I got this powerful feeling that we were going to have an accident. And so I told the group, hey, I have a feeling we're going to, have, I just had this feeling come on me, we're going to have an accident. It's, and we started talking about, well, let's suppose that's right. What should we do? And I said, I got an idea. If we just stop for a while, for 15 minutes, maybe that would change it so the accident won't happen. <laughs> and so the drivers stopped, he pulled over. And we, st we stayed there for a while. And after a few minutes, I says, the feeling's gone now. We're safe to go. <laughs> and so we took off. And of course, we didn't have an accident. But I always wondered what would have happened if uh, we hadn't stopped. That's a good way to up your uh, seer reputation. Just <laughs> All right, go. Yeah, we did. <laughs> yeah, we didn't have an accident. So I'm a prophet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I've always wondered about that. But uh, I had an experience uh, going from Chicago to uh, back to Vegas when I lived in Vegas at the time. And uh, <clears throat> I was south of Yellowstone in the Grand Tetons. And I was getting uh, pains about go up there and get a mystical experience. And uh, I've always respected that area, especially the Tetons, because I've always heard it's a, like a home base for the White Brotherhood. And they, they live within that area. Plus, they 
uh, and have it melt shafts now, I guess, also. But anyway, um, I kept, uh, I was on Interstate 80 going, I was going to get to Salt Lake City and then head down towards Vegas, you know, actually yeah. before Salt Lake City. Mm. And, um, <clears throat> but uh, I turned north and it's about a hundred mile drive from there to up to uh, Jackson Hole. And I uh, picked up a, a fellow hitchhiker and it turned out to be some type of spiritual energy I found out later. Uh, anyway, uh, we went to Jackson Hole and, and uh, he showed me a cut off from the mountain where we spent the night at a van. We slept in a van. Uh, so coming down the mountain, he says, here, you can go in this back way and go this route instead of going, most people go all the way up uh, to the north of the Tetons and, and go into the park that way and then come south. That's how tour, the tour is. And you come out the bottom. But he directed me going into the bottom and going north. And uh, it wasn't a real crowded day, but it was a beautiful day. And man, did I have some spiritual experiences. Unreal. Unreal. And uh, I, I think I got the glimpse of them because I went that direction. So, uh, yeah, I, I listened to things of that sort. Uh, after a while, when you start hearing uh, inner voice clearer and clearer, you can anticipate. Okay. Anticipation. Well, sounds good. Well, we're just about the end of our time limit here, but um, uh, he points out the importance of sounding these two notes. We have a personality note and a soul note. And the soul note, uh, the, he says we need to learn to sound both of them audibly and then inaudibly. And when we sound them inaudibly, we can sound them both at the same time. And that's a, kind of a tricky thing to do, he says. But uh, so first of all, when you say the ohm, one of the best ways to find the note that's most agreeable to your personality is just to uh, uh, sound the ohm on a note that just feels comfortable for you. Okay, so let's concentrate on that now. Everybody just say the ohm to yourself. Oh, excuse me. Oh, oh, my voice is a little hoarse today. Oh, okay, that's a that's a sound that's agreeable to my personality. Now, everybody say, say to yourself, say the ohm in a in a a, a note that feels good to you. And kind of take in what that note is. And if that note feels agreeable to your personality, then uh, there's a chance you've got your personality note. Now, the ohm is com composed of two words. You can go, oh, <clears> oh. <throat> And then you can concentrate on the mm being the soul note. So try to do it two different ways. The om, O part with your personality, and the mm concentrating on your soul. Concentrate on your soul when you sound the mm. And see if see what note materializes. Om. Now for the last part of the exercise, sound the ohm on the personality. And then the second part, continue the ohm, but silently. Silently visualize yourself saying it on the note of the soul. Okay. Ohm. Okay, now I'm going to concentrate on the note of the soul in silence. Right. 
Okay, repeat it again in silence, a note of the soul, but in silence, just sounding it, it through your etheric body alone, and you will feel your vibration raise up. Okay, begin sounding the OM in silence now. I'm picking up good vibrations there from you guys. So we'll do it one more time. Sound the OM in silence now, visualizing a connecting thread between you and your soul. See a connecting light, connecting your third eye, going upward, connecting to your soul. Now, this time, sound an ohm on the note of your personality out loud while you're sounding the ohm silently at the same time on the note of your soul. Attempt to do this now. Om. You guys are doing great. I can feel the results already. Hey, Jay, can I ask you a personal question? Sure. When when I, when my vibration starts to rise, when my vibration is faster, I, I, I am, um, I'm uncomfortable. Not, in a, it's funny, I don't, um, my vibration rises higher and it feels good, but then it doesn't feel good. Well, that can happen if you're, if, if your vibration your vibration may be a little higher than you're used to so that will produce a little uncomfortableness but keep up tuning into that vibration after a period of time you get used to it and it will feel normal and good edward says okay. then edward says to everyone the note of my soul resonates okay oh it's good to have you here today rain Thank you. Yeah, don't be such a stranger. <laughs> and I see Sharon's with us too, so welcome. Sharon. Sharon. I think it's Sharon. We have a Sharon and a Sharon also, but uh, yeah, uh, Sharon call from Australia, I believe it is. Okay. Um, unless uh, I'm pretty sure that's who it is. Okay, uh, well, um, we'll just end by saying the great invocation, and we're kind of beyond, uh, went a little bit over time today, so we'll just say the great invocation and call it a day. And appreciate everybody being here. Oh. From the point of light within the mind of God, let light stream forth into the minds of men. Let light descend on earth. From the point of love within the heart of God, let love stream forth into the hearts of men. May Christ return to earth. From the center where the will of God is known, let purpose guide the little wills of men, the purpose which the masters know and serve. Mm. 
From the center which we call the race of men, let the plan of love and light work out. And may it seal the door where evil dwells. Let light and love and power restore the plan on earth. Now silent sound the silent om and link to the soul again. Okay, my friends, thanks for uh, coming. We'll plan on next uh, Sunday night at 10 p.m. unless uh, uh, something comes up. And I appreciate uh, your uh, participation. Thanks, Richard. JJ, uh, uh, I asked uh, uh, about, you were supposed to send me a box of uh, literature or something. Yeah, uh, I sent it off to you. Yeah, I sent that off to you the other day. You should be getting okay. it any time. Okay, because I hadn't received it yet, and I was wondering if something might have happened. Yeah, I had sent it by uh, uh, media mail, so that sometimes takes a while. Okay. So, uh, yeah, you, know. you probably get it next. You probably get it uh, Monday or Tuesday. All right. Okay. Thank you. You betcha. Okay, appreciate everybody being here and we will see you guys next week. And don't, don't forget to remember to try to do outreach, keep an eye open for other people that uh, might be good molecular prospects. Thank you, JJ, good night all. Okay, good to see you all again. Bye everyone. Bye, bye.